for the abbreviated online version of the ESIG Tucson Spring Technical Workshop. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG, and I'll provide a few brief opening remarks. As you know, we had to cancel the physical meeting due to the coronavirus situation. And after consulting with our session chairs, we decided to proceed with a shortened online version. So we're holding webinars for the two plenary and 10 technical sessions started in mid-March, running through early May, approximately twice a week. You can find the full schedule at www.esig.energy under the events tab. And recognizing the limitations of a webinar with more than 100 people on the line, we'll have individual presentations of 10 minutes or so, followed by five minutes of discussion moderated by the session chair. Phone lines will be muted, so we ask you to use the question box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and not the chat box. I repeat, not the chat box. Today we'll be hosting session one, Evolving Thinking on Resource Adequacy for High VG Scenarios, chaired by Bethany Fru of NREL. Bethany is an engineer at NREL, where she works on resource adequacy and market design issues, and is the chair of our offerings committee. Bethany is also a member of the ESIG Board of Directors and a good friend. Bethany, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Charlie. Um, so I'm excited to kick off this session. We have a great lineup of panelists to talk about uh, this, what has become a very hot topic of resource adequacy. Um, as many of you might know, resource adequacy is, is really about making sure we have enough resources to meet load um, at a future time and location within a certain probability or tolerance of failing to do so. Uh, there are a lot of different metrics and methods that are used uh, for resource adequacy purposes, um, and there's no one standard approach. Uh, so you'll hear about some of those metrics throughout the, the talks today. Um, some of the other key trends that have been popping up with resource adequacy, um, and, and really the, the motivation behind this, this panel, um, is with more renewables in the system, we need to start thinking about not just peak load, but net peak load. So looking at load minus the contribution from wind and solar resources. Uh, we need to look at more hours of the year, um, what's been touted uh, by some entities as all hours matter. So not just looking at summer afternoons, but considering hours throughout the full year. Um, there's a need for considering other operational um, considerations within the modeling tools or other um, analytical tools that are used for resource adequacy, really the, the idea looking at a broader range of operational states. And so that means we need more data, um, so not just one single year but multiple years. You'll hear that from some of the speakers today too. Um, and also some of the new resource technologies that are coming on, so storage, um, things that have energy and capacity constraints, uh, hybrid resources, um, distributed resources. And then there are other institutional and market factors that play into this, which we'll hear from the panelists as well. Um, what types of market designs best uh, support the needs for resource adequacy and what types of approaches can be implemented? Um, there are other considerations such as who should be paying for all of this, who bears the risk of investment decisions for, uh, for resource adequacy purposes. Um, so hopefully we can tackle a lot of these uh, key challenges and trends that have been swirling um, in conversations about resource adequacy. Uh, so just to give you a quick overview, we have five panelists, and I'll introduce each of them individually before their talk. Uh, we are going to start with Michael Milligan, who is going to be laying the groundwork uh, for some of the terminology and those different metrics and methods that I mentioned for resource adequacy, um, and then where we're going with this future of high uh, variable renewable energy. So quick background on Michael. Um, he is retired from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, which was back in 2017, and he had uh, over 20 plus years at the lab. He was actually my mentor when I started at NREL. Um, he has 36 years of total experience in power systems and with wind and solar integration, and he's co-authored or authored more than 220 technical articles, book chapters, and reports. And he's now doing um, consulting uh, with a range of organizations. So Michael, I will turn it over to you. Hey, thanks very much, Bethany, and, and thank you all for uh, joining us on this call. Um, th this topic is sort of near and dear to my heart as it's one of the first things I worked on uh, when I came to the lab uh, back in 1992. Um, and now we've actually decided that maybe this is an important topic to look at. So, um, so a couple of things that I'd love to look at. I mean, we, as, as we talk about resource adequacy and what's happening in the, in the uh, power system world, we're seeing a, a lot of new resources, wind, solar, batteries, hybrid, um, 
Uh, and then uh, demand response in some cases is sort of on steroids. And, and uh, I don't recall who it was that suggesting the term dispatchable demand, which I, I like a lot. Um, so what do we need to do? We need to figure out um, how our methods, our tools, and how we apply our methods and tools and data. How does that apply to this, this uh, brave new world? And a couple of uh, things sort of on my mind, um, you can see here in this first slide, I think we need to be careful of our terminology, clean it up. In my view, we should totally dump the planning reserve margin calculation as uh, looking at the percentage of installed capacity over peak demand. Um, it's not that meaningful, never has been, and it's getting only less so in the future. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some alternative metrics, as, as Bethany mentioned, uh, talking about running the model for multiple uh, different years. I'll come back to that and uh, talk a little bit about data. And um, I want to close with a couple of thoughts about applying LOLP techniques to probabilistic flexibility assessments. Um, I'm not going to answer this question, what are the characters of a loss of load event, but we really think of this in the context of, uh, I, I built a bunch of uh, resources and all of a sudden I realized I didn't build enough. I, I'm, the, I'm the poor system operator in real time. And this is most likely, I think, going to unfold as some sort of a, um, you know, kind of a ramp type of event where the ramp uh, just keeps going. Um, so what do I do? Do I, uh, do I run with lean reserves and, and continue to serve load? Of course, if I do that, I risk a, a blackout. Do I dump some load and keep my reserves so that I can minimize the blackout? Do I let frequency lag, voltage lag? Um, and, and those are all questions I'm not going to answer, but when you think about it, it, and utilities have a different viewpoint of, of which of these is the right way to go, but when we think about uh, resource adequacy and a, and a loss of load event, uh, I think it's really important to keep uh, those things in mind. So I think, um, you know, we're going to always need to do some form of adequacy analysis. Now, the, the players may change. Um, Who's going to be in charge if we evolve in the next uh, decades to a very uh, full and functional market? It may not be that the ISOs or the IOUs are concerned with this anymore. I, I'm not sure that's going to be the case, but um, we're really moving into uh, what my, my friend Dave Olson, who's at the California ISO, is called energy-first planning instead of capacity-first planning, and this is a uh, not a very pretty picture, but you, you see at the bottom here, we have uh, renewables and, and dispatchable demand or demand response. You sort of figure out what, what can I do with the wind and the solar and the batteries, and then kind of what's left, and that's what the other is at the top. And that's kind of what we're talking about uh, filling in with, and it could be storage, dispatchable, dispatchable demand, uh, quick start thermal, uh, maybe other things as well. But we need to move more towards some sort of energy adequacy and not so much uh, peak adequacy. So a, a couple of uh, things that uh, <laughs> rubbed me the wrong way, uh, some, some terminology issues. Um, ELCC is effective load carrying capability and it's, it's really measured in terms of what we call UCAP. UCAP is unforced capacity. So if you imagine a, a thermal unit with a 10% forced outage rate, its unforced capacity would be 90% of its rated. And that's kind of the units of megawatts ELCC is, is worrying about. Uh, when we talk about a planning reserve margin, which I, I'd be happy if we moved away from that altogether, but until we do, that's usually calculated in terms of ICAP or installed capacity. I, I say, well, I've got um, you know 1,000 megawatt peak, I've got 1,150 uh, megawatts of, of installed capacity, ICAP, so I have the 15% PRM. Um, and what I have seen is entities that go off and calculate ELCC of wind or solar, and then they add that into the installed capacity of the other resources. And the question is, what do you do when you add a UCAP and an ICAP? And I don't really know, but it's, it doesn't make much sense. Um, LOLP is loss of load probability. LOLE is loss of load expectation. So you can think of the difference as a probability of flipping a fair head or tail with a coin is 0.5, uh, but if I flip that coin for 100 times, you would expect that I'd get about 50 heads and 50 tails. 
Um, and so th that's a clear distinction. Uh, one day in 10 years, a common target is not a probability, it's an expectation. Uh, one day in 10 years is not the same as 0 0.1 day per year, and that's not the same as 2.4 hours per year. Um, I don't think we're going to find a systematic relationship between the various uh, metrics involved with uh, LOLP. Uh, EUE here is expected unserved energy, and this is just one simple example. You could come up with others where I, I have uh, 10 hypothetical years. Uh, in case one, I've got one big outage, one event, and it causes a, um, unserved energy of 100, uh, call it 100 megawatt hours. Um, but in case two, I've got the same unserved energy, but it's spread over several different outages, several different years, and case three, even, even more so. And so the number of events you have uh, differs here in each of the cases, and yet the unserved energy is the same. And this is just one example to say that I, I don't think there's, um, there's any uh, real uniform relationship uh, between the various uh, metrics. But I'm certainly in favor of utilizing all of them. So I hear, here are some thoughts. Loss of load hours, a number of hours that you have a loss of load event. Um, we, we're seeing a lot more interest in that. Loss of load expectation, I just talked about that. Could be in days, hours, whatever. Um, loss of load events counts the number of times, number of events. Uh, we could do things like calculate loss of load hours divided by the loss of load events to find the average length of our problems. Um, expected unserved energy measured in, in energy units, megawatt hours, gigawatt hours. Um, and we could do things like calculate the, um, the average energy lost in a loss of load event by taking UE and dividing it by the loss of load events. I'm, I'm going to skip through all these beautiful graphs that you see. You, could, you can read about them, but basically, we've, uh, w when I was at NREL, we did a bunch of work trying to look at the relationship between the metrics. Um, I, I have to say that most of our work was limited to a single year, which um, I'll, I'll talk about here in a second. Um, I've actually heard utilities in, in the last year talk about, well, we, we ran our LOLE model for the three weeks in July that are our peak periods. And that misses a lot because you're, you're going to have um, the maintenance scheduling plays a big import, uh, has a big impact. Uh, the graphs here basically show that um, there's a very, very loose correlation between peak demand and loss of load probability. So we need to run the models for not only one full year, but multiple full years. And, and this is an issue I think that's, that's a big deal. Uh, often a utility will do a load forecast um, for the next 10 years based on a, an average load shape, but the weather is going to change very, uh, very significantly from year to year. So we need to keep that in mind. I'm, I'm already out of time here almost, but um, the, the, the two bar graphs that you see at the bottom here are very, very old graphs. Uh, the idea is that if you try to build your wind or solar resource based on the best LOLP or resource adequacy, uh, the answer is going to be very highly dependent on which year of data you use. And keep in mind, we're trying to do this over many years. Uh, do I have enough resources for the next uh, two years, five years, ten years? Um, I'm going to skip over this slide in the interest of time, but the, the question is how many years of data do I need? Uh, here's some data that, that illustrates a changing uh, peak demand in Sweden, multiple year ELCC results from Finland, um, and, and it looks like maybe eight to ten years, give or take, is, is something like, um, you know, gives us some sort of stability in, in terms of our, our answers. Transmission matters a lot. Um, I think these slides will be distributed so you can chase down some of these, but we, we did some work when I was at NREL looking at uh, how much avoided capacity could we achieve if we had perfect transmission and operational coordination in the West. That's what you see on the right, and it's a big number. We're talking uh, 30, 40, 50 gigawatts of generation. Um, that tells me I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, but I, I do want to point out there's some danger with using uh, concepts like a loss of load expectation for flexibility on ramping. Um, if we take a 0.1 per year or one per 10 years event, 
we're essentially saying that ACE has got to be zero um, every 10 minute period except for one over a 10 year period. And I think that's pretty, uh, pretty unlikely. So uh, I'll, I'll leave, uh, leave you with the thoughts of the uh, ESIP workshop of, of years ago, looking at 100% renewables, uh, move to more energy-based metrics, multiple year data sets, better accounting for dispatchable demand, better algorithms to match wind, solar demand, and hydro, and uh, better ways to simulate these long-term data sets. So I'll leave it there, and uh, Bethany, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, so just so everyone's on the same page, after each presentation, we're gonna take a few minutes for some questions, which I will be pulling from the Q&A box in the lower uh, right uh, corner of the screen. So if you have questions, please submit them there. Um, and then we will see if we have time at the very end for, for a broader conversation. Um, so Michael, it looks like there's a couple of questions in here. Um, the first one, I, I'm not sure if I'm gonna capture it correctly, but uh, it's saying, please inform people that peak demand is not equal to peak consumer demand, but it's really expected peak grid resources needed for reliability. So I think maybe this is getting at the planning reserve margin um, approach. So I don't know if you wanna maybe give a quick comment about the use of peak demand. Sure, uh, what, what we typically wanna do, uh, and so this is kind of historical, we, we say, well, our, uh, our peak demand is going to be, you know, 10,000 megawatts and so, uh, the resource adequacy question is how many megawatts do I need to build? And we need to build more than uh, than what we're gonna have. And that that does get to the issue of planning reserve margin. Uh, I think having a planning reserve margin is is great. Uh, what I what I really don't like is the idea that if you're you know 13% or 15% planning reserve margin, you're okay because when you, you have a lot of wind and solar. Uh, you end up usually mixing ELCC, which as I mentioned is a UCAP measure with an ICAP measure and, and a planning reserve margin is almost always calculated as a installed capacity. So we, we do wanna take a look at um, you know, what's happening not only at the, during the peak period, but throughout the year. And that's where I think moving towards more of an energy adequacy is, is a really a good way to go. But I also wanna say that all these other metrics have something to say. So I, I'm certainly not in favor of dumping, uh, other than PRM, uh, I'm not in favor of dumping loss of load hours, loss of load probability, any of those metrics, because I think they're, they're really critical. So Michael, on that point of uh, planning reserve margin or, or pick another metric if you want, but do we have any examples, at least in recent history, of where we've actually had a loss of a load, loss of load event due to insufficient capacity? Uh, I don't think so, but you could argue that some of the recent polar vortex storms have done that. And, and this is where uh, resource adequacy quickly bleeds into the idea of, of system resilience when you have these, you know, one in 50 year, one in 100 year storms. Uh, so on the one hand, I suppose you could argue that, uh, well, my coal piles froze and, and I couldn't move gas to where I needed it. Is that because I didn't build enough resources? And I, I would say, no, it's not because we didn't build enough. We, we didn't foresee some of the things that could happen to the system. Uh, so to my knowledge, we've never had an event that was caused by not building enough stuff. Uh, we, we have transmission outages, we have forest fires, we have a long litany of, of causes for outages. Uh, but I think that this sort of ties back uh, my hypothesis that we've never had a loss of load event because of insufficient resource adequacy is uh, partly based on, on the importance of transmission and coordinated operations. We've got utilities and, and uh, reserve sharing groups. We've got uh, various emergency procedures. We have three large interconnections. And so if, if something bad happens in one area, it's uh, very possible that uh, a, a neighboring area is going to hold them up, and whether that's through a, a specific emergency response like you'd get through a reserve sharing group or whether it's, you know, operator phone call, hey, I've got a big problem, you got to help me, we'll settle up later. Uh, but, but I think the transmission and the, um, and the fact that we've never really incorporated transmission into resource adequacy uh, perhaps helps explain why we've never, I don't think we've ever had a loss of load event caused by insufficient resources. 
Thank you. Okay, we'll do one more question uh, that came through. So you talked about demand response being important, um, but what happens if the demand doesn't play in the market, like if no one decides to, to bid in? And the example in the, in the question here was that New England implemented a full bid for load capability, um, where load plays in the market just like other resources. But in the end, almost no load actually plays in the market. So do you have thoughts on, and maybe this will trickle into some of the other um, presentations where we get into market mechanisms, but do you have any thoughts on how, um, you know, the system would deal with a case where the, the load decided not to play? Well, I, I think that that would be roughly similar to a situation where a resource decides not to play. I mean, if thinking of load as a, as a, a resource, uh, as they do in ERCOT, load acting as a resource, um, I think the market design is, is really key there. The first thing is to uh, get a, a pretty good, robust estimate of what the load uh, is willing and able to do. Um, and secondly, the market design needs to do probably a couple of things. One is to say, all right, if you said you were going to show up. You didn't show up. Uh, what is the consequence? Is it a fine? Is it, you know, whatever it might be. And, and the second thing that, that we always have to do is think about what sort of reserve we need um, and, and what, what's the aggregation of all those events that the reserve is going to cover. And so it, it may be a bit of both, saying the market has uh, some consequences if, if demand doesn't show up when it said it would. Um, and, and the second issue is to uh, have that as, uh, you know, you, you've got a reserve that, that covers that. Um, to some degree, but you, you clearly don't want to have a 100% reserve for all your demand response. And I, I, hopefully I can punt this down the road to Rob or somebody else that's going to be uh, talking more about the market side. But I, th I think it's a concern. I, th I think we need to think through how to fix it. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, we appreciate your, your talk and your, your comments. Um, we're going to need to move on to the next speaker. Uh, so while uh, we hand the baton over to Keith, uh, Keith Parks will be our next speaker. Down to my, he's a senior trading analyst at Excel Energy and has over 20 years of experience in energy modeling. Uh, Keith helps to bridge the gap between planning and operations, providing deep experience in wholesale markets, renewable integration, resource valuation, and beneficial electrification. Um, so Keith is going to be presenting some uh, material on Excel's approach for their upcoming 2030 planning process. So Keith, it's all yours. Thank you, Michael, for that um, presentation. Uh, I, think it, I think that I'm going to be throwing around some of those terms that Michael uh, was talking about. Um, you'll see them you know, sprinkled throughout. Uh, I'm wanting to talk about the value of, uh, specifically the capacity value of demand response and energy storage in high variable energy resource systems. I'm going to talk specifically about the XL Energy Colorado system which currently is getting about 30 to 35 percent of its energy from wind and solar and is slated to get over 55 percent by 2025. Uh, so um, the Excel Energy Colorado system is quickly moving towards this high variable energy resource system and there's a tremendous amount of value uh, in, in, in a lot of interest in these DR and ES systems. So uh, a little background first on what is the XL Energy Colorado system, um, and specifically what are the demand response energy storage facilities that are currently or shortly to be in place in the system. Uh, so XL Energy Colorado is a seven gigawatt peaking system. That's the summer, and about a six gigawatt winter peaking system. There's over 1,100 megawatts of what I'm just generally calling dispatchable energy limited resources that will be in operational by 2023. And, and I break those into these two pieces, demand response and energy storage. Uh, demand response, just to give you a flavor of what demand response looks like in Excel Energy Colorado, and I believe this is characteristic of DR programs nationwide, um, is that they are, um, of sort of two flavors. There's an interemptible demand component, which we have 40, 60, 80, and 160 hour per year programs for our commercial and industrial customers. We have about 300 megawatts of that. Um, 
We also have a, a residential air conditioning program, which we call Saver Switch, or another program very similar called AC Rewards. There's about 250 megawatts of that. So in total, you know, we're, we have three, four, five hundred, five, almost five, five to six hundred megawatt of DR that we use. It's these these programs are four hours per day. They're contiguous hours, and as I was mentioning, they're annual hour limited. So. Just you know, put that in the back of your head, we'll come back to that. The second piece of dispatchable energy limited resources we have is energy storage. And that comes in two flavors. Uh, our Cabin Creek Pump Storage Facility, which is a 340 megawatt two unit facility. So that's 170 megawatts each unit. And they have a, just shy of five hours per day, about 4.8. Uh, there's also two large solar plus storage facilities that we have accepted in our last resource plan um, that's uh, to be built and operational by 2023. Um, and there's just, you know, in aggregate, it's about 450 megawatts of solar. And the important part here for this discussion, 225 megawatts of battery energy storage system. So when you have this sort of suite of um, energy limited resources, what's the, fun, the fundamental question is, what is the capacity value for these resources? And we're going to look at it on, on two levels. We're going to look at two reliability standards. A, and this is, these are ELCC calculations, and they are, uh, Michael, uh, on an ICAP basis. So um, it is a, a very important point he was making there. Um, and uh, we're going to look at a 0.1 hour per year and a 2.4 hour per year metric, just to see what it looks like. And then we're going to look at two study years. And a little note there on, you know, we are using test years 2014 to 2018 to do this. I'm actually currently working on 2019 so that we can have that multiple years of actual load, wind, and solar shapes um, grown to these future year um, installations, a 23 and a 30 look. So I'll spend less time about how I did that, and we'll spend a lot more time on what the answer is. So um, here we are. We're going to start with 2023 and the lower of the reliability standards. And first concentrate on those blue, those blue circles. And those blue circles show uh, a, what we call a theoretical four hour resource. So if we have sort of, we'll call it a, a perfect battery, right? It's a four hour battery and we're installing 100, 200, 300. And, and you can see the important thing is here that, that the capacity credit starts high, but it does decline with increased penetration. Right? That's sort of the theoretical maximum for four-hour resources on a system like XO Energy Colorado. Well, why is that? Well, that has largely to do with the shape of the load and how many hours um, we need over peak. Um, and then I have those various programs scattered throughout here. On the first, the first couple hundred megawatts are those industrial demand response programs. And you can see that they're, they're at a discount to the theoretical maximum, and that's because they are annual hour limited. Same thing goes for the residential AC and commercial programs. They are 60 hour programs. They are also at a discount to that theoretical maximum. And then we have things like Cabin Creek, which is at a premium. Why? It's at a premium because, well, it's not a four hour resource. It's actually a five hour resource. And then second, it's soaking up value that's sort of left on the table by those prior DR programs that aren't reaching their theoretical maximum. So Cabin is sort of getting a, a, a plus one benefit here. Not only is it five hours compared to four, but it, it, it's also soaking up a lot of value that maybe other resources, because they were annual hour limited, are missing. And then finally, those two solar plus storage facilities, they're coming in right on that trajectory. So we quickly normalize to this sort of theoretical maximum, and those are pure four hour per day programs, four hour per day, um, four hour per day resources. So we're going to go from 2023, we're going to go to 2030. And the big difference that you're going to see on this slide is uh, an increase in the amount of solar installed on the system. So here we go. I'm just going to flip back and forth a couple times. So the, the, the big point here is with increased solar, you're going to see a higher overall theoretical value, that blue line moved up. The second thing you see is the discount for those DR programs, particularly the industrial and commercial programs, decrease. That is, it closes the gap 
you know, as you get more solar, your peaks become peakier and those, and, and the, the days on those peaks become, these, these programs can meet those really peaky peaks easier. The one exception here is that residential AC program, it sort of languishes at about where it was before. And that's due to this, this, this concern, wintertime concern or non-summer concern that happens, that, that this reliability starts spreading out throughout the year. And without resources that can provide capacity throughout the year, ones that are summer only are going to languish in their capacity. And this is, this is something that Excel Energy is just only just now starting to, to think about and, and trying to think how do we structure DR in the future to be able to maintain high capacity value for these programs. The, the energy storage um, resources there, they maintain their value um, because, well, they are available uh, year round and can provide uh, the, the capacity day after day after day after day without being limited at all by hours. So I'm going to go back to that 2023 look, just to baseline ourselves in that 2023 look again. So here we are. This is the same slide we had before. We're just level setting you because we're going to go from here to a higher, more stringent standard. We're going to go from 2.4 to 0.1, and we're going to see what a higher reliability standard does. I'm going to flip back and forth again. Same year now, just a higher reliability standard. So again, you see that the value of these dispatchable energy, that, that theoretical maximum increases. And I think as significantly, the discount for the hour limited resources decreases. It, it sort of meets that, ma that maximum potential. Um, it reaches its maximum potential because of the higher reliability standard. And this is more typical of a reliability standard that you would see across the country, the sort of 0.1 per hour for a, an ELCC type valuation, right? Again, uh, the Cabin Creek and Solar Plus Storage Facility, they, of course, they rise as well along with that theoretical increase in capacity credit. So for my last slide, I'm going to show you, I'm going to go from 2023 to 2030 using this 0.1 per year standard. So this higher, sort of more typical reliability standard, but we're going to, we're going to add a lot more solar and see what happens here. There it is again. I'm going to flip back and forth. So now the discussion is, well, what happened there? Well, relative to that 2023 look that we just had, you have an even higher theoretical capacity credit due to the increase in solar. And that's because of this sort of making, making our net load peaks are even peakier. And there's really no discount for those 80 plus hour annual uh, annual limited resources. You can see that the 80 hour and the 160, they're like right on top of one another. Only the 40 and 60 hour resources lag, right? And guess which one lags more? Well, the residential air conditioning program lags more than say the commercial, even though the commercial is evaluated after the residential AC. So that's speaking to this summer only resources have a deeper discount due to the increase, increased winter reliability concern. And as, as we've seen in the past, uh, energy storage holds its increase in value proportional to the theoretical max. So I, I do say don't read too much into this result as the capacity credit continues to decline steeply for additions beyond 1100 megawatts. That's not shown. If we were to continue this, this line out, you would, you would see it start to tip down. So there is sort of somewhere out there, there is a, a, a sort of a maximum amount of these types of resources that one would want to have on their system, at least cost effectively. You know, I mean, if cost was no, no issue, then of course you could, you could install as many of these resources as possible and you would, um, you would have a reliable system. So um, as a final thought here is just my conclusions. Um, I think the biggest one is that there is a declining value with penetration for DR and energy storage. Um, and, and another way to say that is DR and energy, and energy storage compete for the same capacity bandwidth on the bulk energy system. Um, 
they should be evaluated some, somehow jointly. And we're, we're, we're trying to get a handle of what that looks like through this type of analysis. Um, sort of as a, you know, a, an effect of a reliability metric is the second uh, conclusion. That's the capacity to value increases with higher reliability standards. Um, yet still ultimately declines with penetration. You know, you can start at a higher level, it declines a little slower, but eventually it does decline. You know. And the last one, I think this is really significant and why so much is, um, uh, is the effect of solar, and that is the capacity value increase with higher levels of solar. Um, though, though a, a quick warning here, increased solar starves the, center, starves the system of winter capacity and drives winter reliability concern, which compromises capacity value of summer-only DR programs, particularly uh, residential air conditioning targeted DR. So um, it's great that a lot of solar means that you can pair that with, with, with um, these types of uh, energy limited resources, though some of those energy limited resources that have typically been used um, are summer only, and that starts to, that program starts to weaken as you have reliability concerns scattered um, across all 12 months, or really, I would say, across up to seven months, at least for the Excel Energy Colorado system. So um, that's all I have, Beth. I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Keith. Um, so we have time for two quick questions, which we have in the Q&A box. And again, if you have questions, please put those in the Q&A box, not in the chat box. Um, so first one, we'll just do really quick. In the figures you were showing, just for, for clarification, the x-axis, those options were they they were just ordered by capacity is that yes. how you okay. yes yeah, sorry there's no there's no um those those are megawatts so you know we we currently have around 1100 megawatts of these types of resources sort of related you know loosely and and you can see that the the graphs are stopped at 1100 and this is a marginal capacity credit evaluation so so of course the the first one sort of gets the most value and then subsequent evaluations um, get less and less value. And it's just a matter of um, uh, we've chosen to put those DR programs up front followed by um, uh, uh, energy storage resources um, uh, by order of when they were installed. Great. So one other question is how did you estimate the theoretical maximum for the four-hour storage? So your blue dot. I ran it. I, I ran um, um, I through the uh, ELCC process that we use. Um, we I ran a a four hour battery energy storage system with 85% efficiency through that model, and I used that as sort of the the a theoretical four hour resource. I call it theoretical because those those resources don't exist on Excel Energy, at least not in that magnitude. And I, I used it mostly just to just to um, just to compare and contrast these, these other types of energy limited resources, DR and energy storage, relative to this four-hour baseline, and that all these resources sort of track to this sort of declining curve that uh, if, you were to, if you were to think of this as a, as a single resource being repeated over and over and over again. Some resources are below that line, some resources are above that line, and there's reasons for that, whether they're limited by their amount of annual hours, uh, by their seasonality, uh, or uh, maybe have a premium because they, they have more hours per day available to them um, than others. So it, it's more of a visual marker to those. Uh, I guess I shouldn't necessarily call it a, um, uh, a, a maximum, I, you know, because each of those programs might be, are slightly different, though they're all very, very close to four-hour resources, particularly the DR resources in the solar plus storage. And, and then I, I, I think this might be kind of what the, the person who asked this question was getting at, but were there certain assumptions that you made of how those four-hour storage devices were used when you did those theoretical maximum? So within your ELCC model, how mm -hmm. did you decide when it charged and discharged? Uh, the uh, model uh, uses a um, – it optimizes – the dispatch of those resources to minimize the loss of load probability across the 8760 hours of the year. So for a particular year, whether that be 2014 that has particular load 
wind, and solar shape, which is then, you know, matched to a 2023 type resource. You know, the biggest concern here is making sure that we're capturing the, the new wind and solar that's to be installed between now and 2023 since that 2014 uh, profile, though we have a lot of really, really good data that we believe that we can estimate what that looks like. That provides a particular loss of load probability, you know, strip, 8760 strip, and then each one of these resources are, are dispatched against that, each time sort of maintaining that reliability standard of either 0.1 per year or 2.4 hour per year metrics. So it's, it's the, the dispatch algorithm isn't on price, it isn't on uh, load or net load, it's on LOLP. And, it, it, and that LOLP, of course, is shifting and changing with each dispatch of that resource. So the first one's dispatched and that changes that profile. The second one's dispatched, it changes this profile. And even within each of these categories, there's sort of, you know, um, it dispatches in 25 megawatt increments until it gets up to, you know, the full capacity of energy limited resources here that we have at 1100. So um, it's trying to maintain a, a fair evaluation based on a single minimized LOLP metric. Great. So we have a couple of other questions here, but we're really running out of time, so I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, maybe, we can hold, maybe we can hold these to the end and see if we have time at the very end um, once the other panelists are done presenting. Would that sound okay to you, Keith? That sounds great for me. Yes, I'll just I'll follow your okay. lead on that. So thank okay, you. Okay, great. So yes, yeah, so for those who have submitted questions, we'll try to get to those at the end. Just want to try to stay on on schedule. Great. So we're going to move from Colorado to Japan, and so our next speaker is Obimoto San, um, who is going to talk about some of Japan's resource adequacy challenges um, and how they are attacking those. Um, so a quick background on Obimoto San. He is a project professor at the University of Tokyo. Um, and he's been in his present position since 2008 um, and does research in the field of energy systems integration. And he woke up very early to join us <laughs> uh, today, so we're very grateful to have him, and I'll turn it over to him now. Okay, thank you very much for a uh, kind of introduction. Today, I'm going to talk about resource adequacy considerations based on our experiences in Japan. So uh, this is agenda. Uh, at first, uh, let me uh, talk about the situation of renewable energy uh, deployment in Japan. In Japan, under feed-in tariff program, renewable energy increased by 22% annually. The total application of PV installation under the feed-in tariff program reached around 80 gigawatt, and extra PV deployment is 40 gigawatt, while the current national target is 64 gigawatt in 2030. And in Kyushu, the southernmost island of the four main islands of Japan is the area where the power system operation has been most severely affected by PV penetration of more than 8.5 gigawatt. In Kyushu, the peak demand is 16 gigawatt in summer and winter, and minimum daytime load is 8 gigawatt. There are four nuclear units, uh, 4.6 gigawatt, which are currently in operation. And uh, as you can see here, the share of PV is much more than uh, other shares of Kyushu in Japan. So next one is uh, system operation is in Kyushu. Uh, since uh, the first renewable curtailment, on October 13th in 2018 in Kyushu, there were 60, uh, 56 renewable containment up to last year, June. Uh, from March to May, when the demand is low due to the minimum air conditioning loads and maximum air irradiation, there are more frequent renewable energy containments with the maximum containment of 2.5 gigawatts. So this uh, diagram shows the typical system operation with containment. Uh, it was at 12 o'clock on October 21st. You can find uh, 0.9 gigawatt of containment 
uh, 7 points gigawatt of power demand, uh, 4 point gigawatt of base load generation, and such and such. So in the system operation uh, in Kyushu, PV output uh, predictions are carried out using three different PV output uh, prediction models, and each having uh, its strength and weakness. And in the actual operation, according to the match, matching of the satellite monitoring data with a hit historical ins installation pattern, uh, in installation pattern, the three predictions are weighted to yield the average prediction of three hour horizon. And uh, as of now, uh, as a fundamental flexibility resources, CCGT plans with shorter startup startup time means ramp up of the residual demand in the evening. On April 30th, all CCGT units were made online in every 15 minutes, as you can see here. And online renewable energy containment is a key for security and efficiency of the system operation and reduction of the required renewable energy containment. Under the collaboration of Japan government Kyushu Etco and renewable generators. Kyushu Etco installed online control devices with 22 PV units of uh, 0.3 gigawatt, uh, gigawatt. As a result, as of now, uh, PV capacity of 8.5 gigawatt in Kyushu are uh, uh, categorized by online, offline control, and by connection voltages. As you can see here, the units of 4.7 gigawatt, approximately 60% of the total PV capacity in pink zones, are currently subject to renewable containment. And among these, as of June 2019, a total of uh, 26,000 PV units of 1.7 gigawatt can be online controlled while around 2,000 units of 3.1 gigawatt cannot. Uh, this is a photo of renewable energy, man, uh, energy management system in the control room, uh, room of Kyushu. Uh, next one is uh, system operation enhancement in Kyushu. For less containment, it is very effective to increase operational export capacity of AC500 interconnection with the main island. Over frequency relays were equipped with three, uh, five geothermal and 81 hydro uh, plants to increase the operational capacity by a 0.5 gigawatt. And a grid stabilization system was installed to immediately and selectively treat multiple major generation plants in case of a failure of the interconnection. The system increased the operational capacity of the interconnection by 0.3 gigawatt. And since the autumn of 2019, last year, the renewable containment procedures were improved by a more real-time operation. The target amount of renewable containment, which was calculated based on the historical maximum forecast error in, in the same month, is now calculated based on the smaller historical average forecast error in the same month. At the same time, offline units now are ordered containment in the previous day, while online units making the best use of online control are ordered containment two hours before the real time only when necessary. And in Japan, we also have batteries. Um, in Kyushu, 50 megawatt, six hour sodium sulfur battery plant is yeah, in operation. So we added so many uh, various uh, enhancements in Kyushu. However, uh, we still have uh, emerging resource adequacy issue. And 
but we have some uh, possibility of uh, mitigation. On March 2nd, 2019, the actual PV generation was 3.5 lower gigawatt lower than the forecast 85 gigawatt of previous day and uh, of uh, even of the morning. The demand was uh, 0.9 gigawatt more than the forecast. The operator revised the schedule of containment, uh, power plants, and such and such. But uh, pump storage uh, hydro on that day came to uh, its bottom of storage in the evening. So uh, we think uh, it is very crucial for security of supply that in the winter, a reduction of PV generation often comes with an increase of demand. Um, however, we have some possibility of mitigation. Uh, manageable demands, such as heat pump water heater and EV charging, discharging, tend to be in full operation uh, during the period of high generation forecast. The demand of heat pump water heaters and EVs can be effectively reduced in case of an extreme forecast error under certain arrangement in advance between aggregators and customers. This situation has not uh, realized, but in the near future, we are except, expecting this uh, situation. Um, uh, we analyze this kind of uh, mitigation, uh, mitigation possibility with a uh, model. A uh, general flexibility model can analyze different reserve requirements met by uh, different reserve resources, including distributed ones. In the analysis of Kyushu, demand of tertiary slow reserve is defined as an extreme forecast error, and the reserve can be met by EV and heat pump water heater shedding, as well as carryover of tertiary fast resources which are supplied by uh, traditional generation and such and such. Um, this is the uh, example of the result of the analysis, analysis of supply of reserves. Um, left, uh, left hand side, you can see secondary fast slow and uh, in the center, you can see tertiary fast and slow and uh, right-hand side demand and supply situation on April 1st of, uh, of Kyushu area. So uh, heat pump water heater and EVs are available to reduce demand anytime when large generation is forecast with PV and wind. Thermal power plants are not economical to keep ready for a rare event. In the analysis, the requirement for upward tertiary slow reserve of four gigawatt is met by uh, pumped storage hydro, EV, and heat pump water heater. Conclusion, Kyushu area is one of the power system whose system operation has been mostly affected by VRE penetration. The system operation of Kyushu area has been improved to accommodate growing renewable energy while keeping stability and reliability. One of the emerging issues in Kyushu area is an extreme forecast error of correlated renewable energy and demand. The energy storage capacity of uh, pump storage hydro plants is becoming short to meet the extreme error. Among uh, several uh, alternatives, manageable demand, such as EV charging, discharging, and heat pump water heater have a possibility to mit mitigate the extreme forecast error in a secure and economical manner. We need to continue data collection, analysis, and improvements. Thank you very much. 
Great, thank you. I, I don't know if you want to show, you had a, a, a slide with the cherry blossoms in Japan. I don't know if you want to show that. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Just for fun. Uh, this is, uh, <laughs> we all need something happy. <laughs> yeah, cherry blossom in Kyushu. Yeah, um, all the, almost all the uh, cherry festivals have been canceled, but uh, people and the streets are very quiet, but the people are enjoying uh, blossoms. Yeah, that's all. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. I figured we could all appreciate photos of, of, of flowers right now, something happy. Um, so one question we have um, for the Japan system here is, how fast can the pump hydro resources uh, change direction? Are there any new designs maybe being proposed for a faster pump to gen cycle? Yeah. Uh, to, uh, to stop pumping, it takes uh, several minutes. And to restart, it takes uh, several minutes. But we uh, sometimes we need to wait for stabilization of storage. It, it may take 10 minutes. Uh, this is an idea, but uh, not uh, exact data. Okay. Makes sense. That's helpful. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Um, and then one other quick question, and then we'll we'll have to move on. But uh, I was curious. You said you also have storage um, in in this one region, the battery storage. Are there, at least here in the United States, there's a lot of talk of how to compensate storage. Um, are you is Japan having similar conversations? And if so, is there a, a leading uh, proposal for for how to signal and compensate for those resources? Uh, financial uh, compensation? Yes. Um, uh, as of now, they are, uh, uh, they are owned by a transmission operator, so no compensation is uh, considered as of now. I see. So uh, as, uh, as discussed in the United States, we need to start discussion about uh, storage. A compens uh, compensation of storage. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for that um, interesting talk, and we will um, move on to the next presentation, which is Matthias Fripp. We're going to head to Hawaii now. So we've gone from Colorado, Japan, and now to Hawaii. Um, so Matthias is going to show some modeling results that he's been doing, um, looking at the Hawaii system. A little background on Matthias. Uh, he is an associate professor of electrical engineering at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. Uh, actually, I don't know how to say that word, so Matthias, you can correct me. Um, he specializes in creating and using tools for optimal design of power systems with large shares of renewable energy, um, all the way up to 100%. He focuses on the challenges of integrating intermittent renewables with storage, demand-side response, and thermal generator unit commitment. He's a lead author of the open source switch capacity expansion uh, software and participates actively in the utility regulatory planning processes in Hawaii. So Matthias, it's all yours. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's a real honor to be on this panel um, with a lot of people whose work I've admired for a long time, and there's a lot of people in the audience, too. So um, thanks very much for having me. Um, so yeah, as Bethany said, I work in Hawaii. Um, we're the first state to have adopted a 100% renewable portfolio standard um, by 2045. Um, and I think some of what I'm going to say is going to be just kind of going to reiterate, especially some of what Bethany and, and Mike were saying at the top of this. Um, but basically, I'm going to try to test and, and show evidence maybe for this hypothesis that the capacity value or capacity credit that you would assign to variable generation um, depends, you know, it's not a stable number. Um, and I think because of that, you know, it, 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 it's not super useful for planning since it doesn't it's not persistent um, based on what else you build in the system. Um, and maybe a more important measure is uh, how any particular resource affects the overall cost of running a reliable power system. Um, and so this is really kind of going to be a plug for, as Bethany said, every hour matters and, and a sort of approach to planning, capacity planning that looks at full time series of production potential from renewables and how you would use other resources in the system to, to counterbalance with those. So um, I'm going to sort of present a little experiment with a toy model of Oahu 
Um, this is using the switch power system planning model that Bethany mentioned, which um, uh, I, I haven't put in any details here, but if you're interested in more details, I, I encourage you to go to the website shown there, switch-model.org. Um, but it's basically a, a capacity planning model with a unit commitment and dispatch model nested within it. So you can do um, very sort of granular, uh, well-informed sort of bottom-up modeling of how you would use storage or demand response um, including sort of intertemporal constraints within the day that like you've got to you've got to charge your storage at one part of day and dis, uh, release power at a different part of day um, and seeing how that would integrate with what the renewables are doing at those same times of day um, and demand response ends up looking a lot like storage so I I think at least that it's a very good tool for for sort of automating uh, and optimizing the planning process and that lets you then do these kind of experiments so what I'm going to show is results from a toy model of Oahu. So this is kind of intentionally oversimplified. Um, it's a 2045 version of the power system, um, based so with you know somewhat lower costs for renewable energy than we have now, and probably somewhat higher costs for oil. Um, it's a greenfield system. I did that basically because there, there's already enough thermal capacity in Hawaii, so it's hard to say anything about the thermal capacity requirements if, if you already have enough and, and it doesn't change when you add renewables. So I start with nothing and basically allow as much thermal capacity as you need to complement the renewables. Um, all of this work is based on using historical hourly load shapes and weather. So we basically project those to the future. Um, we do this for 13 sample days that are sort of selected to represent the range of weather that you might see. Um, and uh, so the basic idea is I first optimize for a 100% renewable power system. I see how much wind and solar you would build um, and batteries. And then I uh, basically sort of force the system to build different amounts of those and see and re-optimize the thermal fleet and see how the size of the thermal fleet changes um, as you adjust the wind and solar and battery resources. So, uh, and by sort of comparing how the size of the thermal fleet changes when you add or remove solar, um, you can get an idea of at least the sort of weather-driven portion of load carrying capacity. So now I'm going to show some fairly dense graphs. This is this is a very sort of high dimensional problem. Um, I'm going through permutations of um, sort of no wind, medium wind, which is half of what you'd need for the 100 or what you'd want for the 100% RPS, and then 100% of what you'd want for that and similar sort of low, medium, and high battery scenarios. Um, so that's nine permutations. And then I do, I think, 11 different amounts of solar. So this is the result of about 100 model runs coming up. Um, so that's a surface over three dimensions, which is almost impossible to graph. So instead, I'm giving you a graph of graphs. And hopefully, you'll be able to puzzle this out. So what I've got here, each of these graphs shows um, as I so I'll just sort of start at the top right. That's with um, high wind adoption. So it's the amount of wind you would want in 100% RPS and the high battery adoption, which is the amount of batteries that you would want in a high RPS or in 100% RPS. Um, and then as we sort of trace along, what we see is once we've locked those in, the first few megawatts of, of wind have, well, first few at least have quite a high capacity value. So they do let you avoid building um, about, you know, one megawatt of wind lets you avoid building about 0.2 megawatts of thermal capacity. But that benefit sort of diminishes as we get more and more of it. Um, interestingly, in that scenario, it doesn't actually go to zero. Um, and this gets to some of what Michael was saying. Um, these very high renewable systems end up being energy limited rather than capacity limited. Um, and so what you end up seeing is the thermal capacity that's put in um, is used to, to basically handle the most difficult days. And the di they're difficult days, they're not difficult hours. And so there are certain days in Hawaii, they're generally in um, sort of November, December, when you can have low wind and low sun simultaneously. Um, and you may have plenty of batteries, but you just don't have enough energy 
to fill those batteries and serve your loads that day. And so you end up putting in thermal capacity on those days to provide enough energy, not, not uh, power capacity. If you've sized your batteries to sort of, so this is a very high renewable adoption scenario. So you've, you've put in part of what we're seeing with the sort of diminishing solar capacity value is initially you're serving a peak load that appears during the day then you pretty quickly punch through the daytime load and you, you're basically storing surplus solar during the day to deliver to loads at night. Um, and so at that point, you've got a lot of batteries on hand, um, plenty basically to get you through the nighttime load. So you're not capacity short, um, but you are energy short. You don't have resources to charge those. And so you end up putting in thermal capacity, which you run all day on those difficult days to charge the batteries. Um, and so what we see is this kind of fairly stable uh, capacity value, at least when you have high batteries. So the top row of graphs is all high battery scenarios. And we get a fairly stable capacity value for solar, um, which is really driven by the fact that um, if you add another megawatt of solar, you can use that. You'll get you know, maybe half the normal value from it. Um, on those low sun days, that will allow you to charge the batteries a little more and install a little less thermal capacity for those days. Um, so you get some capacity value. Um, there's, so there's a sort of important interaction between batteries and solar, which is if you don't have batteries, you don't get any capacity value uh, from large amounts of solar because you're just throwing it away once you have a lot during the day. Um, there's some interaction, it seems like, I haven't really diagnose this, but there's some interaction as well between wind and solar. So if you have less wind, the initial tranche of solar has more value. That might be because the wind uh, helps with daytime loads, and then you have less need for solar. Um, so that's sort of reflecting some complementarity maybe between wind and solar. Um, but the gist of this is Clearly, the capacity value of solar, which is the blue line, the, the level of the blue line, is not a constant number. It depends on how much solar you have, which is sort of left to right within any of these individual graphs. Um, and this is in a system with a roughly one gigawatt peak. So we're talking about solar getting up, you know, the optimal amount of solar is on the order of two and a half times the peak demand. Um, so it depends how much solar you have, but it also depends how much wind and how much uh, batteries you have. Um, you could look at these and say, well, maybe there's a sweet spot uh, somewhere around the corner where solar capacity value evaporates, and maybe that's the point to stop. I would argue these graphs really don't tell you much of anything at all about how much wind and solar to build. So the next graph that I'm going to show shows the cost of your power system. Um, so it's the same set of scenarios. We have low, medium, or high wind adoption left to right, and low, medium, and high battery adoption from bottom to top. But now what we're showing is the average cost of power production. Um, and that's probably the more interesting metric. Um, these are all reliable systems, but oh, I'm out of time, so I better round off pretty quick here. Um, these are all pretty reliable systems, but the cheap one is way out here on the right. So you've gone on installing solar and continuing to reduce your costs, looking at this top right corner, you're continuing to reduce costs as you add more and more and more and more solar. Eventually, you kind of bottom out and maybe tick up a bit as you move towards 100%. Um, on the other hand, if you don't have wind and don't have, especially if you don't have batteries, the sort of sweet spot is a lot less solar, still quite a lot of solar. Um, and so that, again, it varies depending on what you have. So I would argue that you need tools that really are ec economic optimizing tools to decide the whole portfolio of what to build. Um, and that mathematically looks quite a lot different from the type of capacity, the type of models that are used for capacity markets now. Um, the capacity expansion, there's room for this kind of more advanced capacity planning in the integrated resource planning processes that regulated utilities use. Um, and we've been doing that here in Hawaii um, it's a little harder to see how that can work in market regions. I think it's possible to, to adopt capacity markets that are mathematically similar to what I'm describing. Um, I think it's more of an open question whether bilateral contracting, some sort of tetonment type of process 
can get to these optimal portfolios, um, which I'm going to leave for the next people. So I think I'm a minute or two over, so I'm going to stop there. Thanks for your patience. Great. Thank you, Matthias. So we have two questions, so we'll do those really quick, and then we'll trans – actually, we have more than two, but we're only going to do the first two. <laughs> we'll hold the third one for the end. Um, so first, uh, I think we'll be really quick. What was the duration of the batteries that you use in this analysis? These ones – so Switch can optimize the duration, but here, to keep it simple, um, there were bulk storage batteries with six-hour duration, and then there were also – um, sort of zero hour batteries that could be used for contingency and regulating reserves. Okay, thank you. And then the other question we'll get to right now um, is would another way of saying what you're saying, um, which is echoing Michael, is that the capacity value of a variable resource depends on the extent to which demand is elastic in response to the supply demand conditions? Yeah, I didn't show that here, but that's certainly been something we found when we when we modeled elastic demand. Um, I think to a first order, you can just think of demand as looking a lot like storage. Um, and so if you have flexible demand, or flexible demand looks like storage, it can shift load from non-sunny times to sunny times, which is pretty much what storage does. And so it matters a lot. Great. Well, we're going to keep moving. Um, but we thank you, Matthias, for the great presentation. Um, interesting uh, results there. So we're going to move to our last speaker, Rob Gramlich, um, and he's going to talk about this idea of uh, bilateral contracts and other uh, possible market mechanisms uh, for ensuring resource adequacy. Uh, so a little bit about Rob. He is the founder and president of the Washington, D.C.-based consulting firm Grid Strategies. He previously served um, as a uh, Senior Vice President and Interim CEO of AWEA, the Economic Advisor uh, to a FERC Chairman, and the Senior Economist of PJM. So, Rob, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Bethany. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Great. Thanks, all. Yeah, so we're going to uh, turn to some economics now because we are in a world in most of the U.S. where um, we're not really following uh, good utility practice generally, which is the old way of getting utilities to do things like ensure reliability. Um, so we're going to look at some of the incentive uh, issues. And uh, to look at that, we have to recognize that we have different regions that operate in, in different ways. Um, let's see. I'm trying to advance the slides. Not sure it's working here. Rob, so Rob the there left should be. Of the, oh, yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Sorry. The arrow under the zero one on the left side of the screen. There's a tab there. So just hit that down arrow. Okay. There we go. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so we have different approaches. Um, I'll start at the top. Uh, state regulated um, uh, resource adequacy with RTO monitoring and coordination. This is sort of like California ISO, SPP, and MISO in the U.S. Um, uh, we have, um, uh, and, and these are the market areas. So you heard from Excel earlier about, um, for example, in Colorado, there's no RTO there. So that's more the traditional vertically integrated utility model with a state regulator overseeing it. These three are the models uh, where there are wholesale markets and sometimes retail markets. Uh, the second model is there was there's an RTO obligation. They actually determine the the um, uh, capacity need and they place that obligation on load serving entities. And then across the Northeast, these three RTOs, there's a mandatory auction uh, called the market or call it a capacity construct. Uh, with an administrative demand curve. Um, and then the, a third model that is less familiar to, to most people and the one I'm going to spend more time on um, is a, a decentralized market through bilateral contracts uh, and the, the penalty of basically not uh, procuring enough supply is the real-time spot price when the system does get short and that's what we have in ERCOT, the Texas system, and I believe in Australia and New Zealand that is similar. I know uh, Mike Hogan's on this call. He and I have written about this uh, together. There's a paper on the Grid Strategies website that uh, he had a, 
as much input into as I did. And um, uh, so we've written about that in the context of a decarbonized system. Uh, showing these regional markets uh, geographically and on a, on a map here, um, again, you see the greenish areas are more of the centralized capacity market style. The gray areas are the traditional vertically integrated utility without much of a whole. And then the, um, the brownish areas, uh, there's. Uh, Rob, RTS. hey, Rob. Uh -huh. um, you, you cut out for a little bit um, when you were starting to describe the map. I don't know if you want to go back and repeat. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Um, so this shows the different resource adequacy regimes um, in, uh, in, in map form of uh, where the RTOs have resource adequacy responsibility. Um, the, uh, the gray area is where it's the traditional vertically integrated utilities, and um, the uh, northeast shows the green where it's the um, capacity market. Um, moving to the next slide. So, um, a lot of words on this page, but this is uh, we're now diving into this decentralized. Um, uh, market structure here, and uh, you know this really is about roles and responsibilities. Um, with resource adequacy essentially being a, a public good, um, then you know there's sort of two ways to get it: either either a central authority, a government, needs to force it to happen or just do it, uh, or you need to assign responsibility to somebody and make them uh, accountable. For it. So this is the latter model. It's a decentralized market structure like they have in Texas, where um, in the middle of the slide here is the um, retail suppliers. And um, they are the entities that are responsible in this model for procuring power on a long term basis. Um, you can see the RTO role above that is they're really more the air traffic controller. They're not doing long term resource adequacy. Um, and the state uh, regulator uh, does have a role here to make sure that those retail suppliers are, you know, have the incentive and ability to do their job of procuring power on a long-term basis. Um, so, for example, those retailers need to be credit worthy. That's uh, actually something that's not always the case in retail access states. Uh, we just put out a paper last week about how outside of Texas, the other 13 states in the country with retail access don't uh, do that very well. So you do have to make sure they are credit worthy suppliers and that they have the ability and incentive to procure the power uh, that's needed. Um, and then the utilities are really in this model more for the wires companies. They, they do the uh, monopoly transmission and distribution assets. So moving to the market design, the last slide was structure. This is a design, in other words, the rules. Um, uh, you have um, a spot market um, that uh, allows for the bilateral contracts to operate behind the scenes, um, you know, between willing parties signing long-term agreements. They can be physical or financial. Uh, the spot market is really for the residual balancing every entity usually comes in into a given day a little bit long or a little bit short on power so they can balance that out at the spot market that's what spot markets are supposed to be um, and there are uh, there is an energy price at each time and location uh, most places are using locational marginal pricing now that's the efficient uh, pricing system and it changes very frequently hourly or sub hourly um, the reliability services are also procured. This is getting into real-time operation, not resource adequacy, but it's just important to see how the whole system works. Uh, there are operating reserves procured in that real-time market. Uh, and then uh, another aspect of this short-term spot market is scarcity pricing. And this is important, not just for the short-term operation, but very importantly for the long-term resource adequacy, because think of scarcity pricing as a speeding ticket. If you're 
a retailer and you did not do your job of procuring the power needed to serve your retail customers, uh, then you could wind up short having to pay $9,000 megawatt hour prices. Um, so that, um, that prevents the free riding right there. And so if those retail retailers are financially well equipped uh, to ha handle, you know, to procure the power they need, and if they have this threat of this, essentially this penalty payment, um, then, th you know, they're, they would be expected to, uh, to do that job. Um, and, uh, you know, that's sort of how the, the whole system works. And um, it's important to, I think, also realize that really all of these systems, the other models we were talking about before, are ultimately financially enforced at the end of the day, right? Again, we don't really have good utility practice as a thing to follow on, uh, to rely on, since we have wholesale markets operating in most of the U.S. and in many countries around the world. It's really a market-based system by and large. So we need some type of penalty system. What this is in the ERCOT system is a very fine-tuned penalty system where uh, the penalty is exactly defined by the exact time and place where you may be uh, short. So now uh, the question is whether this is working. We can look at performance here. Um, uh, and I think I've got two more minutes, so I'll try to run through these quickly. Um, this is a slide of the price duration curve. The uh, last farthest outline is the 2019 prices that we now have in, um, uh, just in the hours where the price has exceeded $200 a megawatt hour. Um, and so you can see the other uh, uh, five years there were, were lower, but uh, as most folks know, um, the uh, reserve margins were fairly low in Texas last year um, and remain somewhat low. Um, so, and with a hot summer, that's driving up prices. So, what you want to see from an economic standpoint is when you do have a little bit of a uh, supply shortage situation, the prices rise and that attracts new entry to the system. So we do see the prices rising. Uh, now, is that enough on this slide to attract new entry? You can see that the, on the right side there, 2019 peaker net revenue was $146 a kilowatt year, and the cost of new entry below that is 105. So they're, they're making 40% more than they would need in a normal year. Uh, to pay for their investment. So uh, basically, the answer was yes, that was a strong signal for new um, entry to come in. Um, this is another way of looking at the net revenue targets, the uh, peaker net margin on the left, just over $100,000 a megawatt. Uh, 2019, again, uh, exceeded that by a fair amount. If you look at the cumulative um, net revenue for a, a peaker. Uh, this is the revenue they earn above their operating costs. So it's basically the money that goes to pay for the capital costs of the units. Um, why is this relevant for the clean energy transition and uh, renewables? Well, one thing is renewables are very capital intensive and they also have zero production costs. So energy prices can end up being low after the capital is committed. So that makes a lot of people scratch their head about how's the system going to work in the, in the future with a lot of zero production cost energy on the system. Uh, so one answer in the Texas model is that is addressed through prearranged long-term contracts. So those contracts that a developer can sign before uh, they actually commit uh, their capital um, can uh, pay for the unit before they uh, take that risk. These contracts can be physical or financial or, or a variety. I think we're pretty much out of time, so I'm going to skip this. Just This is a Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, slide about uh, what prices look like over a 24-hour period with high penetration renewables, just to show that this, this price effect, when you get zero production cost renewables, the, the bottom line is the solar that kind of it looks like the duck curve, um, but it's a, a price curve there um, uh, with prices going down in the middle of the day. But again, you know, the answer is these 
uh, these contracts that allow for the financing of, of new generation, and that's how, in a market, you, you can get resource adequacy is to attract uh, the needed resources. So it's the it's the prices and the prearranged contracts that can it that can do that. Um, and just as one example, I'll just close on this slide here. Uh, NRG is one company there. They're a retailer in Texas. They signed 1.3 gigawatts of solar PPAs. Uh, with an average term of 10 years. So that helps to finance that new generation. And then from a reliability resource adequacy standpoint, you know, they need to serve their customers in the evenings and overnight as well as during the day. So they're not only buying solar, they're buying whatever they need uh, to serve their customers 87, 60 hours a year. So um, again, it's a, it's a different model from what most people are used to, but uh, it is highly flexible and perhaps more conducive to the uh, the resource transition. So Bethany, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Rob. Um, so we have about five minutes left in this, uh, this session. And so uh, it looks like there's at least one question for Rob. Um, and if there's no others that come in, then I wanna try to get back to some of those uh, questions that were lingering for Keith and also a couple more for um, uh, for Kaz. So, so first uh, for you, Rob, um, the question is, what impact are renewable buyers like Facebook having on wholesale markets? Sure, thanks. Uh, those renewable buyers are a major source of new contracts and new resource development. Um, it's a very interesting market to study from a uh, you know, system operation and reliability standpoint, because many of the buyers are looking at renewable energy credits that are not always physically defined. I think some of the companies like Google are now trying to match their purchasing by time and location with their load, but a lot of the other ones are not doing that. So it's, uh, anyway, that's a longer conversation we can get into at some point. Great, and it looks like, oh, there are a couple more. Um, I'll go to the first one that came in. Uh, so do you expect a storage resource could be seen Oh, sorry, sorry, let me start that over. Do you expect a storage resource could have seen a net revenue curve that looks similar to the net revenue curve of a combustion turbine? Yes, absolutely. Um, going up to the um, slide here, just to show a quick picture, this Astra, uh, or sorry, Ascend Analytics on this uh, slide did this model. This was shown at an eSIG event maybe about a year ago. Um, but if you're a storage resource, you basically look at the this mean hourly spike probability. So look at like hour, you know, 18 on the slide. Um, there's over a 12% probability of a of a price spike. So you know you don't know it's going to happen. But if you're a storage resource, you can plan your state of charge to be ready for that. You know, hour 16 through 20 just in case that price spike happens and then discharge, of course, you can discharge these batteries extremely rapidly um, in order to uh, to meet that. And if you had done that last summer, I think you would have been in the money. Great, so it looks like there's a lot of activity in the Q&A box and I'm not gonna get to everything, um, but one more for you, Rob, um, which I think is a little bit of a follow-up. It's from the same person as the Facebook question, uh, but they're asking, what do you see as the resolution to the wholesale markets and state energy goals? Oh yes, well, there's a big, big debate going on about uh, state energy goals because some 30 plus states have ambitious clean energy requirements, but uh, FERC, which is in charge of wholesale markets, has decided that uh, essentially any of those state policies that push or provide some incentive beyond what the market alone would, would provide to new renewables um, should um, basically, uh, that the wholesale market should be protected from that. Um, uh, and that you know renewables shouldn't also get capacity value or other electricity products. Um, personally, I don't see how that's legal. So I mean, I think that whole thing is going to court, and we'll hear from the courts in, a, in about a year. Um, that's called the minimum offer price rule, MOPR. Um, but that's a legal question, um, and certainly different commissioners have different views, and you know a turnover of commissioners could change. Uh, how that is done. I mean, I, you know, I, I think 
um, we're necessarily, in a, we're a United States of America. A lot of states can make their own decisions. The Federal Power Act leaves that role to states. So I think a lot of states will continue to choose the resources they want. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, nobody gave FERC the power to tell them otherwise uh, and to interfere. So it, it, it's going to be messy, but I think eventually we'll get back to that. Uh, that system and then the wholesale markets operate on top of whatever the states do and they operate uh, efficiently um, given the resource preferences that different states and utilities and customers have. Hey, thanks, Rob. Um, I know we're at the end of our official time now. Um, before folks start to drop off, I wanted to uh, take a minute for a quick uh, public service announcement um, that there is a reliability um, or resource adequacy uh, working group meeting um, this coming Monday. Uh, if you are a member of ESIG, stay tuned and there will be more um, information coming by email. Uh, but this working group meeting is going to kick off a new initiative to redefine resource adequacy based on first principles, uh, specifically for systems with high amounts of renewables, uh, as well as load modifying resources and correlated events. Uh, so if this topic of resource adequacy um, was intriguing to you, or if you have a particular interest in this, and if you're a member of ESIG because the working groups are only open to members, uh, Feel free to keep an eye out for that and to join that meeting. Um, Aaron Bloom is the chair of that working group. Um, so I'm going to make an executive decision. Uh, I, I, I don't know if folks still have availability, but it looks like people are starting to drop off of the call. Um, there were some remaining questions. Um, if you were one of the ones who asked a question and we didn't have time to get to it, uh, please feel free to reach out to the speakers directly or to myself or to Ryan and we can connect you with the speakers if you don't have their contact information and we can try to get your questions answered. I apologize that we didn't have time. But um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank our speakers again. Um, I want to thank all of you uh, for, for, for participating um, with the great questions and the discussion. Uh, despite this being a, an interactive online virtual experience. <laughs> um, and just a, another reminder again, as Charlie mentioned at the very beginning, that we have a full lineup of uh, the sessions from the actual Tucson event that will be done through these webinars. You can find the full schedule at the ESIG website, www.esig.energy. And the next uh, webinar as part of that original agenda will be Thursday of uh, this week, uh, so that's March 26th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and that is on synchronous condenser and control system considerations for weak grid applications. So again, uh, thank you for your participation, and we hope to see you at the next uh, webinar. Thank you. <laughs>